in the service catalog group, uh, his name is, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it's spelled nail. And so I okay. think I think got a little nuts there. <laughs> That's cool. Thanks. Yep. All right, three after, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, all right, community time. <clears throat> so for those of you who might be new on the call, which may just be one person, this is a time for people who don't normally join the call to bring up topics they would like for the community to discuss that are not on the agenda. So do we have any topics for discussion? All right, none, moving forward then. Um, no update on SDK, in fact, there was no meeting today. I, um, Demo work. So we're making some good progress there. If you guys were to look at the very bottom of the proposal doc for our demo scenario, hold on a sec. Let me see if I can get down to the bottom real quick. Okay, that's one. <clears throat> okay, it's taking way too long to load. But down at the bottom, there's some sample message flows. And Jude, maybe you can paste a link into, um, into the chat here. But Jude put together a, a swim lane kind of flow as well. Down here at the bottom, yeah, what you'll see is, I'm sorry, so go ahead, Jude. Yeah, let me just find that, I'll put the link in there. Yeah. <clears throat> now basically, what we have here is that basically the sample message flows for one complete walkthrough of the demo of somebody ordering coffee them the supplier running out or the retailer running out getting more supplies the truck handling it all that kind of stuff so um this should be getting awfully close to people being able to code up some stuff um hold on a minute let me copy the link here just so you guys can see what this one looks like too all right so here you can see it um we're not going to go through it here but the point here is that if you guys are interested in participating in the demo um join make sure you join the the uh, the demo slack channel if you don't in it already ping me and i'll, I'll invite you because it's, it's a private channel but this doc should give you most everything you need in combination with the uh with the swim legs um we will have a phone call i apologize for the late notice right after this one um to do some last some more discussions about it but otherwise we do have phone calls every monday at uh, 1 p.m eastern as well to go through it. But we do have the infrastructure up and running. Uh, I, I personally have written a, uh, a simple function that handles all the various roles and everything does sort of seem to work for the most part, but we need more people in there to make sure that that it works for in general for everybody. So, but as I said, we are making some good progress there. So if you guys want to participate from a company perspective, please join. The sooner you get in there, the easier it will be for you because <clears throat> this is, this scenario is actually a, fit, a bit more complicated than previous scenarios that we've done. So we want to make sure that you have time to get all your code working right uh, if you want your company logo to appear in, as part of the demo. All right. Any questions or comments from either the other Doug or Scott or Jude or anybody else from the demo team? Not yet, but we can save them for the post Discord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Okay. Moving forward then. Uh, KubeCon EU, nothing really much has changed there. As far as I know, I don't think anybody's really done anything with the charts. Um, I think, Scott, what was the date you, you noticed? It was like, what, May 5th is like the official date for when they're supposed to be due, but most people don't pay attention to those or something like that. Um, the, the only date that people need to pay attention to if you're supposed to be presenting <clears throat> is we did agree that by the end of this month, meaning the end of April, we would have a rough draft available for this working group to review. So uh, you know who you are. Um, start working on those rough drafts and those slide decks that we put out there for people to work on. We do have a phone call after this one at one o'clock. So it's gonna be a combo demo call versus KubeCon planning call. Because for better or worse, it is kind of the same people. But there were a couple of questions there I had for you guys. So if you can make it to the call right after this one, uh, please do try to join. Um, because I do have some things to discuss there. But are there any questions from the broader community about what's going on there? All right. Lastly, relative to conferences, um, as I mentioned before, we do have a 35 minute cloud event session and a 35 minute serverless working group session. They were both approved. Um, we are looking for speakers. Um, I will be there, so I could technically handle both, but I would really appreciate it if someone else was gonna be there uh, to, to participate in the fun. Um, 
I know I suspect Kathy might be there, um, but I don't know anybody else. So if you're planning on going to KubeCon China or you want an excuse to go, uh, we are looking for speakers here. Um, no more than two per session, so up to three more additional speakers um, would be nice or, or is the option available to us. Okay, so just pay me offline if you want to speak about that one or speak at, at that conference. Um, still haven't done my presentation yet for this. There's nothing for you guys to review there. Um, I believe the next TOC call is, I think, maybe next week, where they're going to discuss what independent users means. So we're still waiting on that, on that decision. All right, let's jump into PRs, unless there's any topics people want to bring up before we get into PRs. All right, moving forward then. Do, 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 do. All right, so I can't remember this gentleman's name, Mike. Okay, Mike Winters made some changes to the serverless white paper that we produced. Um, so while this isn't a cloud events topic, it is part of our serverless working group stuff. And basically, I think that's it. Yeah, he just made these set of changes here. Um, this is just a slight wording change. This is the bulk of it down here. So I'll give you guys a chance to read this over. I think we had two people review it so far and they were okay with it, but I wanted to give the, the group a broader, the broader group a chance to look it over. So I'll give you guys a sec to read that. All right, any questions or comments on that? It seemed pretty safe to me. Nothing? All right, any objection then to merging this PR into our white paper? No objection, but there is a comment in chat that oh. it seems like a plug. Yeah, I, I, that did kind of pop out, unfortunately, well, for better or worse, we do actually plug other things as well. So, I mean, for example, right up here, we talk about AWS step functions. So it's not like this is brand new. Um, if people feel strongly about it, we can go back to the author and ask them to remove it. Um, we just may, may appear a little bit inconsistent, to be honest. But if that's what you guys want, I, I'm okay with pushing back on it. My, my question was actually whether there were other examples of the same thing rather than saying, oh, we shouldn't do it. It was, you know, is this a, a unique pattern or, you know, um, you know, an example of something that is pretty commonly done? I believe we do have other examples in here. Like, like I did mention the step function thing. I know there are other spots in here we do. Sorry, I meant stuff. the workflow tool uh, oh. with the documenting what decisions were made. Um, you know, it it's not clear from the text here whether this proof of concept is the first thing or merely, you know, and one example of many. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Evan, I misunderstood. Okay. That's okay. Um, that's why I decided to speak up. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Um, I'm not familiar enough with the space to know the answer to that one. Anybody have an answer for Evan? Okay, not hearing any. Uh, my point of view on this is if there are others and people want to mention them, I think it's fair to to call them out. Yeah, it, it seems harmless to me. I just, um, I was curious whether, you know, a example from a particular consultant, consultancy as a proof of concept was, um, you know, if, if that was enough or if we wanted more references. Yeah, I think- I'm fine with leaving it as is. Yeah, I think we had more, I don't think anybody would object to adding them, but not hearing anybody speak up. And we are where we are. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, any objection then to approving this one? All right, cool, thank you guys. Whoops, I can't type. All right, Klaus, would you like to talk to your PR here? Um, yes, so um, background is that I'm uh, thinking about this um, PR I was supposed to provide for quite a while already about uh, immutability of event context. And I felt it was difficult to speak about this uh, without a few new terms or terms we were already using actually, but they are not defined yet. So like 
producer, consumer, and intermediary, I think, is, is important also for that. And um, so I, I just tried and, and came up with uh, something I, I felt was reasonable, but I'm um, happy to, uh, to get any, any feedback. And, and I don't know if people agree to how I see, for example, the difference between producer and source. Uh, that might be one of the things people would discuss about. Um, yeah, so that's the, the background. Okay. Uh, just one thing, since this doesn't fit on my screen, there's one more edit down here, which changes producer and or change to producer and consumer down here on this one line. Yeah, so producer for me is always something, well, um, let's say, active, uh, so um, basically a, a piece of code, a process, a container, whatever, that is actually putting the, or creating the event in, in, in memory and then sending it while the source is something more logical, uh, a logical construct um, that in this abstract way is then the source of the event. I mean, we have those examples like a GitHub repository or um, whatever we have as typical sample sources. Okay. Any questions or comments for Klaus? Now, I don't know how many people have had a chance to actually look at this yet. Um, but I do feel like this is kind of an important one if we do move forward with it. I mean, it seems reasonable to me, but um, I don't want people to rush this decision because this could impact other PR. As Klaus said, he's working on another one that follows on to this. Do people want more time to review these or do they feel like what you've seen on this call is sufficient to approve it or to, to vote either way, I should say? Uh, I, I have well, one question regarding mm -hmm. the description of source. I find it slightly contradictory that it talks about source as the logical system or service, but then says if a source is not aware of cloud events, a producer creates the cloud events. I think if a producer is a specific instance processor device and source is the logical system, the source is basically never <laughs> aware of cloud events because it's a logical system and not, not something actually creating the implementation details. Oh. I mean, I think we're tempted to distinguish here between, for example, GitHub, um, which doesn't produce cloud events, but you might bridge them into cloud events. And I think some of the Microsoft implementations are actually producing cloud events. And so you would think of the, the Microsoft sort of systems as being a source, but you would need some external producer in addition to GitHub to generate an event, a cloud event from GitHub. Oh, in, indeed. But Maybe it should say if a source is not aware of cloud events, a middleware producer or an external producer creates the cloud event because if the source is not aware of cloud events, the source's producer will not create it. And that's how it reads to me at the moment. But maybe that's just me. Can, can you say that last part again one more time? I, you lost me a little. If it, said, if it said if a source is not aware of cloud events, an external producer or a middleware producer creates the cloud event. That's just so right now it reads to me as if a producer within the source would create the cloud event, even though the source is not aware of cloud events. Just okay. a, a I, I would be careful of using middleware because I think middleware may mean something else specific that external would be fine, I think. Yeah. Yeah, external or separate or something to make it clear that it's not necessarily yeah, part of the source. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Okay. I know we had one potential, we had an edit here, which is adding a, a small little word in there somewhere. Um, any other suggested edits? Otherwise, I'd kind of like to say if no one has any complaints or wants more time to review it, maybe we could prove it with that one agreed to change. But I don't want people to feel rushed either. So <clears throat> don't hesitate to say you need more time if you want it. Okay. So Klaus, it sounds like you're okay with making that one minor change. 
So if you can make that change, and then we'll ask for you know one or two LGTMs after that offline. Um, it sounds like people are okay with approving this. Is that okay? Is that fair with everybody? Okay. Not hearing any objection. Approved with. Oh, good God, I can't spell. Uh, see, this is really bad. You guys get to see all my wonderful spelling mistakes. Okay, here we go. All right, thank you, guys. Uh, da -da -da -da. All right, now, I don't believe Alan is on the call. And this one was opened up a little too soon for us to take a formal vote on, but I did want to bring it up because it is kind of an important discussion. I wanted to get a sense from the group. Um, so Alan is basically proposing that the ID itself uh, be made optional. Um, he doesn't see it being necessary in all use cases, therefore it, it should not be required for producers to include it. Um, uh, unfortunately, he made a whole lot of other changes, so let's, let's focus down on here. But basically what I want to do is, like I said, find out from you guys is how you felt about this in, in general. And we can then worry about <clears throat> whether the exact wording changes are okay or not. But what do people think about the idea in general of making ID optional? Go ahead, Jim. So don't we have a problem then with uh, uniqueness? You know, the, the other stuff we've been writing, I thought that included event ID in the sort of uniqueness criteria. Mm-hmm. Yep, it would definitely impact that, yes. Does he have a specific use case he's talking about here where he thinks the idea is irrelevant? It seems a bit unusual to me. So yeah. he does. I need to pull back the issue discussion here. Hold on a sec. Um, mm -hmm. It looks like some of the examples, now this is using source and not subject, but um, he has some examples of sources which use a UUID to represent the object. And if it was, for example, object create with a UUID, um, it would be unusual to get a second create with the same UUID. Well, wait, Evan, you lost me on that. What's, what's the problem with that? I mean, events should be immutable anyway. Uh, well, it's not clear that you need an ID for that create event. Um, because you already in the source or subject have a UUID, which is unique. And so adding an ID to it doesn't seem like it is necessary. Are you saying if a source emits multiple events? Uh, if you, if a source, well, if the source string is unique already, do you need an ID as well? Well, the source, the source is one entity. The, the events that it emit um, should also have IDs, I would have thought, um, so you can distinguish between them. Um, you don't want a case of something going wrong somewhere within the, one of the transports and receiving the same event multiple times, um, um, even for that purpose. If you look at the examples that are added in this PR, there are... Um, sources with a universally unique URN using a UUID. And the ad files changed. Uh, yeah, but isn't, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit out. I think, I think this is a strange use case. Scroll back up uh, to 10. If you have a create, for example, with a source like that, there should never be another create with a source like that. If it's if that's actually specifying the object that got created. So, but doesn't that? I apologize, Jim. Is your hand still up? Uh, no, sorry. Okay, I, but so so Evan, I'm a little confused though. I agree with you that if there's a particular event that's flowing around where the source happens to be unique, that technically someone could use that same source as some sort of unique identifier, but you can't guarantee that at all because the, the purpose of those two properties are really very different. They have different semantics and different purposes in life. But that doesn't mean that they couldn't, for example, take that UUID from the source and use that 
in the ID field itself because they know it happens to be unique, so it serves the purpose well. I'm not, I'm not attempting to suggest that this is a good thing that we should include, but I think the thinking is if that source is already unique, guaranteed unique using something like a UUID, maybe you don't need ID as well. I'm not worried about the extra bytes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just add a comment here? I mean, it seems on first glance, it seems counterintuitive um, to have an event without an ID. Um, and my second comment would be, why, why don't we just do the, the obvious thing here first for the, the common use cases? And if we hit edge cases, then we, we can push that back to whoever generates the event to provide a blank ID or something like that. Or, or a, a sentinel value or something, um, but it does feel counterintuitive. So if I remember correctly, I think also one of his concerns was <clears throat> not only that he may be asked to produce a field that is not necessary for his particular use case, but also that creating a unique ID could be very expensive sometimes, depending on the environment. I think that was another one of his concerns. Just trying to channel him since he's not on the call. Oh, Christoph, your hands up. Yeah, there is in the PR, it, the first uh, line uh, so in, in the optional part, uh, sorry, uh, scroll back down. Um, it says like a producer may omit ID if deduplication is not required. But I think our goal with cloud events is to say that I write a producer and then later on at consumers. So I get applications that I don't even know that will exist when I write my producer. So therefore I cannot know if deduplication is not required in my opinion. So basically that me that case doesn't exist. Okay. So I'm not necessarily hearing a lot of support for this direction, but let me be very explicit about that. Is there anybody in the call who does think that ID should be optional? Okay. Um, I've heard, oh, Tapini? Oh, I want to go after that. I'm not so concerned about the changes to ID. I don't, I mean, if someone has a closed system where they don't need the duplication, I don't really care if they use ID because it's a closed system. Uh, but I'm more concerned with the changes to source. It adds additional constraints. That this is, is not only a change to have an ID, but a big change to how source works. Yeah, I wasn't going to get to that yet because if we if, if we didn't like the idea of ID, then I didn't I wasn't going to worry about the changes to the source. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so let me ask this: There were several people on the call who spoke up who seemed to have some concerns with this, and like I said, because it's so new, we can't technically vote on it either way anyway. But can you guys add comments to the PR itself, expressing your concerns, um, just to get the conversation going within the with the within the PR itself? Because I don't believe. Uh, Alan is going to be able to make these calls in general since he didn't make it today. Um, but that way, he can. Have, you guys can have a, a discussion within the PR. Can you guys do that? So I'm trying to remember who, who spoke up. I think Evan, you might have spoken up, and then Neil, you. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Okay. In that case, we don't need to dwell on that <clears throat> since we need him to make the case for it. And obviously, go back and look at the issue that I pointed to, because he did make some arguments in there, um, which you may or may not find compelling, but I think it'd be useful for you guys to, or useful for you guys to read that. All right. Um, so, okay, so this one we can't talk about because we're still waiting for James to get back to me on that one. Um, yeah, I was going to come up and never mind, I ignore that. Okay, so let's talk about uniqueness. Well, hmm. So Scott, let me pick on you for a sec. Since you're very heavily involved in both these issues of the uniqueness stuff and the quoting for HTTP headers, which one would you like to discuss first? Scott? Uh, he may be having Zoom issues. I see you bouncing up and down there, Scott. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, let's take him in order then, unless Scott, when he finally gets off his Zoom issues. Well, unfortunately, if he can't come off Zoom, he's, he's probably the one of the biggest advocates for changing the scope. So we need you, Scott.
I may be able to speak to some of them too. Okay. Well, okay. So let's talk about the scope of uniqueness. So as of today, okay. So first of all, this PR is basically advocating, I don't think a semantic change, rather a clarification because the spec, um, in my opinion, anyway, strongly pushes towards the idea of uh, ID is unique from each producer so that if you can then combine ID plus source, that's going to give you some unique tuple that you can then say, okay, if I see this tuple again someplace else, I can dedupe it if I wanted to. And so this PR, I think, just tries to clarify that. I don't think it actually tries to change any semantics. I, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. However, as part of reviewing this, some people, in particular Scott, raised a concern. He said, well, if we're going to go for some sort of dedupe logic or uniqueness, you know, you know, some more uniqueness statement in there, he believed we should add some other properties to there. So for example, uh, I think he at least wanted type and he may have actually also wanted subject to be pulled in as well. I think it's both subject and type. Okay, there you go, thank you. And so the discussion here for the group is, do we want to do that? Um, now we, we did, just for more history, we did briefly discuss this on a phone call either two or three weeks ago, I can't remember when. Unfortunately, Scott was not on the call then to advocate for it. Um, but there wasn't a whole lot of people speaking up saying we, they want to change things. That's why we didn't do anything formal because Scott wasn't on the call. So either Scott, if you can talk to it, or Evan, if you could talk to it, can you explain possibly why ID isn't sufficient from a particular producer? Um, I think... I think instead this is more to assist producers so that they don't end up needing, there may be a natural unique thing that's an ID, but you may end up wanting to publish two different events um, for that same natural ID because the requirement is that IDs are unique. If you already have some system like a database that is giving you unique IDs, um, it might be natural to use that. However, if um, I think fire, I think the Firestore documentation is what I've been quoting. Um, you might publish both a object created and a object updated. Um, it would be nice if you could use the same ID for both of, for both of those um, because you already have a natural database ID. Similarly, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. similarly um, including subject, if your natural ID was something like a generation number that counts up, it might be unique on that particular etcd key, but might not be unique globally. So um, if you said that that four coordinate of type and um, type, source, subject, and um, ID is unique, then um, that basically aligns with your schema in the database and you can ensure uniqueness using database properties rather than needing to make up a number. Okay, anybody have any questions or comments on what Evan said? Oh, come on. <laughs> you guys can't be so, quiet. So a, another specific example is publishing Kubernetes events, which have a generation pulled from etcd. Um, if, if we believe that the source and subject split is useful, um, the source might be your Kubernetes cluster, but then the subject would be the particular object that was updated. Okay, I don't see anybody raising their hand, so I'll raise my hand because I, I have some opinions on this one. Um, it, it seems to me, though, that there's a little bit of either confusion or potential confusion with sort of the, the path that you're headed here. Because while I agree that the entity that is producing the cloud event itself may look at some incoming field and say, oh, okay, I, I can use that field for the ID. Um, it's still the, the cloud event producer's responsibility to make sure that ID is actually unique. Um, because the minute you start making assumptions that it actually has some other semantic meaning, like for example, I think in your example, you had a, the same ID being used for the create and an update. The minute you allow those to be 
uh, shared across events, you almost get into the situation where you almost have to define the semantic meaning of what it means for that same value to appear in both events. And we don't really need to get, or it hasn't been our position to get into explaining what a lot of these extra fields mean, especially from an application level perspective. Um, so I can trivially make them, you make those two unique right. by putting a abbreviation based on the type in front of that database thing. Right. Um, and then I can make the IDs unique. But that seems like I'm adding extra work to the producer for the purposes of adding extra work to the producer. Um, and it doesn't really seem like saying, hey, if you want to publish these two events, you need to put some unifying thing in front. Um, adds a lot of value to the downstream consumers who could still just take off that prefix and try to match things together. Um, we're not saying that they would have to be unique. We're just saying they're allowed to be the same if they're different types of events. Yeah, but I think what, what you said there is kind of interesting. You want to a consumer to be able to, or let's say we did munge type and, and ID into one field, like you're suggesting. You said a consumer there would could split them apart and, and look at the ID part and do some reasoning about that. But I would actually uh, argue. I'm actually saying you could compose ID with some prefix that's related to the type and that unique database sequencer that you've already got. Right, right. No, I, I get that. But then you said the, the consumer could then split off you know, take off that prefix and be left with the database ID and then do some, some logic based on that. And I would actually argue that that would be misusing our spec to do so because we don't define, well, that was weird. <laughs> we don't define the semantics of this ID to mean anything other than it's just unique, right? Some application, if you want a field in there that represents some application level semantics so that people can correlate events in some way, I would suggest that there's some other field that you guys should use to do that or and create a new field, but this field is not meant to be used for that kind of correlation. And, and, and try to, to use it for that would be I'm dangerous. not suggesting using it for that correlation. I'm suggesting if you want it to be unique, if you have a database that produces unique identifiers, that's a good way to make sure it's unique. Yeah, and I, I kind of, that's the way I kind of view it, which is, the, it's the producer's job to make sure it's unique. And if for whatever reason this producer uh, doesn't have unique IDs on its own, but between type and source to become unique, then do exactly what you said. You know, string cat all of them together, stick that in ID. Then we should probably just document that. Yeah. I would, I would much prefer that type of solution with the recommendation like that, simply because when you get into this notion of different, you know, like four different fields to combined, make something unique, you then have to explain what does it mean when only three are unique? They're and different. That, I mean, they're completely unrelated. Well, but then, but what, but the, but then what's the point of allowing it? I, I'm, I'm not going to use the right word, so let me just stop there. It just seems yeah. awfully weird. So, okay, anyway, I, I spoke too much. No, that's okay. No, anybody else want to chime in here? Um, at the risk of Google arguing with Google. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I, like, my conception is if you are emitting an event, you are a source. And I don't like, and it sounds like that is not your understanding. By the definition of the PR that we've reviewed uh, half an hour ago, it's, there's, a, there's two bodies there. There's the source where the event came from, and then there's the, the adapter that's actually making the event into a cloud event. That's what we're talking about. But from the term, like in terms of the cloud event, isn't like, isn't it a source for the cloud events? Is that wrong? I've always interpreted it as the source. Oh crap, we lost them. I lost you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, until Scott gets back. Rachel, do you want to keep going? Do you want to wait for Scott to get back or should I move on to Tapini? Uh, no, I don't. I don't want to. Um, no, I think I think that we have different ideas, and I want to let him represent himself. Yeah. Okay. We'll come. We'll come back to Scott in a sec. So, okay, Tapini. So, oh, go ahead, Scott. The 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 source of the event is, you know, like let's say GitHub. The adapter is the thing that's actually converting it into a cloud event. I think there are two different roles. 
but the source, if you want to go look up uh, the original, like where this event came from, and you're assuming that the adapter is going to modify the source, I think that's a different kind of lying to the consumer of it. And it becomes very, uh, very difficult to understand how to go and fetch the content, like the, the actual PR content, right? That's my point. Can you elaborate? I apologize for jumping here, but just for clarification, can you elaborate? You said the adapter would modify the source. Why would it modify the source? To no, lie? I don't. I don't think it should. It, it should. It should say, "I this event came from GitHub." The type. So, I guess we need some guidance. Uh, Knative chose to use type to encode the entity that has converted that into a cloud event, and and thus it has a different schema than the original uh, source emitted because now it's a cloud event. That schema might be different if there are two opinions on how those events get converted into cloud events. Is this, I'm just wondering, are we verging into the mutable or immutable cloud events space as well here? Like does middleware need to change something to make that coordinate non you know, different if it goes and adds a context attribute. It's, but it's not middleware. It's. Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm wondering, are we verging into that discussion? We could be. It, it kind of is middleware. So I, I feel like we may be verging into it, but I'm not sure we should. <laughs> so let me, let me let me go to the queue since some people are waiting. To Pini, you're next. Yeah, sorry to bring these semantic issues again, but according to the PI that we just reviewed that added the definitions for producer and uh, source, this PI clashes with that because it says uh, each distinct producer must have a unique source. And that's in here we say a specific instance processor device would be a producer, a source would be the logical system. So I would uh, I would think that the new PR would say that each source must have a different source, which is kind of weird to say. But the field, each logical system that is source as defined in this PR, if we accept it, must have a, a unique source. It's simply a uh, terminology problem with the new PR. So I apologize, I got lost in that. Are you saying we might need to modify the text here? No, 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 no. In the other PR, if you look at okay. the, it says an application must assign a distinct source to each distinct producer. Instead, it, according to that other PR, it should say an application must assign a distinct source to each distinct source. <laughs> okay, we'll worry yes, about that. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So there could be more than one producer producing for a distinct source and in that case like how do you understand the the resulting cloud events that come from those two producers i guess i don't see the problem well the, the problem is that they have different schemas because they made different choices the producers are making choices for that source because they don't produce cloud events right but they they could still have the, the same producer can produce two different events with two different sources or the same source doesn't matter, but the producer is just responsible for making sure that whatever ID it chooses to put in there is unique, right? That a single producer make a unique ID, but right. it, in, there are two producers and there is one source. That seems to contradict the sentence that well, bounces just by. So it says an application must assign a distinct source to each distinct producer. So how could there be one source and distinct, uh, two distinct producers? Easily, let's say you have a distributed system that has a user service. It has two instances of a user service. Those both are distinct producers, but they would create events with the exact same source because they are part of the same logical system. 
but I, so I, I, I can buy into that scenario, but I'm still confused as to why that's an issue. Why isn't it just those producers, each of those producers must make sure that the IDs they produce are unique. Yeah, have a UUID, that's what UUIDs are for. Yeah, I, I guess I still don't see the problem. I mean, my problem is just with the wording of this PR. It says each distinct producer must have a distinct source, which I think is simply false or wrong according to the terminology we just accepted. I, I don't really know about the ID stuff. I think we should have a unique ID, but this conversation is beyond me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so to be, to be fair, make a comment on this line, because I do think that's a good, that's a valid change that we need to make it irrespective, assuming we don't completely ignore the entire PR, but um, I, I, I'm not actually talking about necessarily approving or disproving or rejecting this PR itself. Um, I'm more talking about the concept of whether ID is sufficient for uniqueness or whether we need to pull in other attributes. I think it's personal. I'm sorry, say it again, Rachel. I think source and ID are unique and can be used to do. And like, I just don't understand the, like, if you have, if you have something that's creating separate schemas, then why can't they just each create a unique ID? Like, if they all have unique IDs, then it's okay. Yeah. Because the ID comes from the source, it comes from the original event. But that's the producer's choice. And I think, I, I, I'm not sure you heard Evan's comment earlier about how technically the producer could choose to take the subject, the type, and the ID from the source and concatenate them all together and that creates a unique ID. If that's, if that's what this particular producer needed to do in order to make sure that everything was unique. So it was more of a statement of guidance more than a spec change. So I maybe the, take on that. the ID is not needed. We can delete ID and just use type, source, and subject. No, you still no, need No, we, we still need, we still need <laughs> ID. <laughs> but why? It's, it's in the subject. Uh, no, ID provides you a unique value. It may be if you have something in your database that's only unique by subject, then maybe you mix the subject in with that database sequence number. You can do it by concatenation. You could do it by something like con you know, using a hash if you really want to make sure that people don't do the, oh, look, I can split this string apart thing that Doug's worried about. Um, so internally at Google, we have several systems that are based on Spanner um, that pass their clients opaque tokens um, to allow consistent reads. And in many cases, that opaque token is actually just a Spanner sequencer, but um, they tell you, hey, it's a set of bytes. You can't figure out what it means. Just send it back to me. Um, and I'm imagining that ID could be treated that way. You know, it's a set of bytes. We guarantee it's unique. And maybe it has some meaning, but you don't get to care. And to be honest, that's the way I always interpreted ID, which is why I get very nervous when I hear about people using it for some other purpose. Oh, I'm, I'm more worried about how does a producer actually ensure that it's unique. I'm not, I'm not recommending that downstream systems try to use that property for anything other than uniqueness. I'm just trying to make it easier for producers to produce guaranteed unique values. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So I think at one point when Scott said, let's just remove ID, I heard Rachel jump in and say no, but I could have sworn I heard another female voice back there saying no as well. Was there someone else who wanted to join in? <laughs> no, I, there are people around my desk. But... Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, great, we can have another participant in this. Okay, maybe not. Okay. Um, anybody else have any view on this? So just a, just a question, really. Uh, this is Mehmet. The, even assume that the somehow the, you have been able to uniquely identify the the source and producer things like that, but it goes to the adopter, right? That's what you said. Now those fields are going to be carried out through the adopter, or adopter does something else, so you lose those identifications. Who is that a question for Scott? 
I guess I'm, I'm asking genetically here because my understanding is you said this is going to go to an adopter to become a cloud event. And in that adaptation, do you lose this information? Do you lose this uh, unique identification in the, in the adaptation uh, layer? If I understand your question, I think that's up to the adapter to decide how it wants to get its job done. It's only requirement because that's its output produce a unique identifier. Where it came from is completely up to it. Right, but so are we putting as a requirement what the adapter should do here or are we gonna leave it alone or what? Mm, as of right now, that is not something that we get into. The, the spec just defines what goes on the wire. It does not get into how somebody produces the information that goes on the wire. At least I don't think it does. Well, okay. I mean, the information on the wire. So if it is not being modified, then no problem. Uh, so, but if it gets modified, then do you lose this unique identification or not? We keep trying very hard to create a unique identification here. Yeah, I, th I think in this case, the adapter that Scott's talking about is not an adapter from one cloud event to another. It's just some random bytes from, a, from some random event and turning it into a cloud event. And so in this particular case, it's not like there's some cloud event ID that's getting lost or changed in the process. It's, it's actually creating a new one from scratch, I believe. I see. Okay. okay. Anybody else want to? chime in here? Okay, so so Scott, I wanted to get your take on this. Given everything that's happened here, what would be, what, what would be your reaction to taking the, taking the path that I think Evan was possibly suggesting, which is add some guidance someplace around the, about how to create uniqueness, right? Yeah, that, that seems intriguing. Let me go back and give it a try. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. In that case, um, any other people, any other discussion points around just the uniqueness aspect of ID you want to bring up? Okay. Um, so we'll let, let Scott. Um, okay, you'll go off and talk or investigate that side of things. I think. Given that this uh, this PR has had so many discussions back and forth, I don't think we can review this one yet because we need to wait for that conversation to finish. So I'm not even going to push for any kind of vote on that one. Um, we have 10 minutes. Scott, is there anything within, say, five minutes that we can talk about relative to the HTTP header issue? Or do you think it's too big to even start a discussion? Oh, does anyone care? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we could start there. Do you want to remind everybody in like 30 seconds what this issue is about? We don't like the quote in a string. We don't think that uh, HTTP binary headers should be the JSON bytes that got decoded. So basically like what the current spec says is decode the message as a JSON uh, bag of bytes. Take the key that would be the value for the JSON key and stick it in the cloud event uh, as a header value. Like, and so the string gets bytes and then that string gets quote. Uh oh, do we lose it, Scott? Man, it was so weird. Okay. So just to finish it out, if you look at this example right here. This is what the spec currently says. To, oh, you're back. Anyway, go ahead. So yeah, so the spec says uh, the string has double quotes in it. And the way you interpret that is you JSON decode that as raw bytes, but it's a string for real because it's a HTTP header and they don't send bytes over HTTP headers. So we're saying uh, don't do that. Just look, see it as a string. And if you, you understand the strong type, then understand the strong type and parse it like that. Yeah, I think the problem that comes across, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I, um... I think I'm going to channel my inner Clemens here. Um, I, I understand, yeah, it, it grates on me slightly as well, um, but I don't understand how you could do backwards and forwards um, 
translations between structured and unstructured, for instance, and end up with the same JSON representation. Um, you might be able to do it for our defined context headers, but as soon as you end up carrying extensions around, um, I, I'm not sure how you could reliably go back and forth between the two um, encoding schemes. Uh, I don't see any of those, anybody else's hand up, so I'll jump in here too. I, I think the other problem is um, between extensions and non-extensions, right? If you have an extension today and it's say an integer, um, how do you know when it comes across the wire, whether it's an integer versus a string, and then when you promote it for real, if, it, if we don't know the type, it, it's gonna make it a lot harder for people. Um, I, one of the ideas the that- problem with an extension I don't know versus an extension I do suddenly know about. Yes, but I think, I think what's interesting is, and Scott and I, I don't know whether he's serious or not, but I'm, I've been half serious, half joking about the possibility of the spec not dealing with types at all. And everything, when it goes on the wire, is a string from a spec perspective. If something on the other side understands a property and it knows that it's really an int, it's free to convert it when it passes it on to its application or to its user. But from a spec perspective, everything is a string. And I think that avoids a lot of these problems. But I don't know what people's reaction would have to be. I think that's the only realistic way around this, is, is to move to a completely string-based type system. or yeah, single and, type system. Yeah, and as of right now, I think we only have one type that's not a string, that, and it's an integer. I can't remember which, which field it is, but one of them I believe is an integer. And of course, we also have maps that get converted into JSON structures or some like or strings or something like that. So, so the alternative to, to the uh, make everything a string is make everything a string at the top level and don't flatten maps, and then you you preserve typeness. Well, how would a map look? Would a map look like curly brace JSON? It would look like line two seventy nine. Two seventy nine. Okay, curly brace JSON. Okay. So that value could be a number, and it would it would still parse on the other side as a number. But the trouble is, if you try to promote a number into the the, the flattened contexts, it becomes an issue. In this particular case, if this was a custom attribute, um, the user doesn't know whether it's a string that just happens to start with a curly brace versus it's actual JSON, right? I assume somebody would have to know the data type it on the receiving end, right? Yeah, but what's the difference? Well, it's not. I just want to make sure that technically it's still just a string. It just happens to look like JSON. That's right. And, and because of the, it looks like a JSON object, the other side can optimistically flatten it out and give it to you as an as a, uh, actual map, not just a string. No, I think it should actually be a map, if I understand you correctly. So in, in terms of the cloud events type system, this is a map, not a string. Maybe yeah, we made a mistake there. Yeah, so I, I thought the suggestion was to just move to primitive types of string, but still allow maps. Yeah, we'd have to, yeah obviously we need to think more about the map case. But we're, we're running a little long time, but I did want to at least bring this subject up for people to start thinking about it. And please comment in this, I guess it's, the, yeah, comment in this PR, because this is, this is kind of an important thing to get resolved. Um, this, this dramatically changes the, the, the the serialization rules that we have going forward. And we definitely need to get this one fixed. So with that, uh, before I go back and do the attendance for the last time, are there any other topics people would like to bring up? I have a short one. Um, yes, please. Yeah, so I'm just looking at the HTTP transport binding for CE and uh, the content type continues to be application JSON CARS at UTF-8. Uh, do we want to add the uh, the content type extension, such as application JSON plus um, cloud events version three, so uh, that somebody knows, so that the receiver knows what kind of uh, payload this is. Now you're talking about the you're talking about our property, or oh, I'm sorry, the HTTP spec. Sorry, I'm on the wrong spec. The HTTP, yeah, the HTTP, sorry. Uh, three point one point four. Um, under that HTTP transport binding, three point one point four. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so look at the cotton type there. I'm proposing to add application stroke JSON. Sorry, application stroke plus cloud events plus JSON. That's only for structured data. Yeah, this is this is binary. Because notice you have the CE attributes. But isn't this structured as well? No, let's see if we can find an example of structure. Here's the structured one down here. So here we do that because the content in the oh. body is a, is a CE. Oh, okay. So okay. that's the difference. Okay, got it. Oh, right. okay. thanks. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. All right. Any other topics? All right. I, no, I, I think I either heard or saw Doug in the chat. Uh, have you, uh, Victor, are you there? Victor? Yep, okay, I hear you. Javier? No, it's Javier. So, uh, what about Erica? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, excellent. Uh, what about Richard? Hi, Doug. Hello. Did I miss anybody besides uh, Javier? Uh, Eric Erickson's here. Eric. I jumped on to that late. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, Eric. Oops. Anybody else? All right, cool. All right, thank you guys very much. We'll talk again next week. And for those of you who are going to the KUKAN EU or involved in the demo stuff, um, please hang on the call so we can continue those discussions in the next hour. Otherwise, everybody else is free to leave. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm going to leave a comment on the 422PR tag. Uh, it's getting kind of confusing now that we have a terminology for a source which does not equal the contents of the field source. So we, I think we said you want to leave a comment. You meant on Klaus's PR? No, no. On the, well, I guess both. I should, but I don't really know. The, the, <laughs> the definitions for the source in that new terminology versus the field source results from very confusing text now that I'm writing it out. Well, the diff yeah, the field source says it's identifying the uh, producer and that's then not appropriate anymore. Yeah, we're probably gonna have to rethink that. But I, I still have a feeling that the concept of source is well, kind of underdefined. Um, so far, we were just using another undefined term to explain it, but. Yeah, yeah, it, it's very nice to have that terminology, but they do conflict now. Anyway, let's, we'll probably talk about that next week or something. I'm leaving some comments. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah, please. I, is there any reason to think that we should not merge Klaus's PR? Because I don't want to, I, I don't want to rush it. Yeah, I do think so, because this is really confusing now that I'm writing it out. Yeah, it's it's good. And no, I I would prefer more discussion. So okay, yeah, I don't want. I definitely don't want to rush it. Okay, let let the, I'll hold off on that. But um, class, maybe you can make that one change that someone suggested. So we can get that behind us. But then, uh, Tapini can make his comments on top of that. Yeah, just a concrete example. If I have a source according to the new terminology being two u two instances of a user service, as I said, uh, they can still have multiple sources inside them, meaning multiple. Uh, instances of the field source or different contents. That's quite confusing. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. It's, it's after one o'clock my time, so we can get started. Oh, actually, hold on a second. I see one thing here. Oh, crap. Okay. Sorry. I had to look at my schedule. All right. Where are we? Um, okay. So, uh, relative to the Kukan EU stuff itself, um, Klaus volunteered offline to speak with Scott at the intro for Cloud Events session. Um, so no real question there. Um, just letting everybody know. I'm assuming Scott's okay with that. I already um, talked to him. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yep. I didn't think it'd be an issue. Um, Let's see, Vlad and Clemens still doing the deep dive. That hasn't changed. Okay, so for the intro on the serverless one, I know Scott volunteered to do sort of a, a quick intro there. Um, I was going to volunteer to basically be sort of the moderator just for the birds of a feather type session, if, if you assuming you guys are okay with that. The, but the real reason I wanted to speak to you guys was 
originally for the serverless summit, Kathy and I were going to do a tag team for a summary of what has the serverless working group been up to. Unfortunately, Kathy is not going to be able to make it. Now, I, I think this is only a 35 minute session, so I could technically do it all myself, but is there somebody who'd like to, to go tag team with me on this? Unfortunately, Scott isn't on the call. At one point, he may, he may have indicated some, some desire to do that, but since he's not here. Anybody here on the call want to join in that fun? Okay. I don't hear anybody. I don't <laughs> know if I have the time, honestly. Okay. Well, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not asking because I'm trying to pressure somebody into it. It's, it's more, I don't want someone to feel like they were excluded when they wanted to do something. Like I said, I have no qualms doing it myself. I think it's only a 35 minute session, so it's not exactly huge. I'll refrain from now. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm not hearing anybody jump up and down. What I'll do is I'll reach out to Scott to see if he really wants to do it. Honestly, I think he might be overloaded because he already has others. What he has, doesn't he have? Yeah, he's doing the intro there. Then he has this serverless thing here. And he may have other talking sessions there, so he may be overloaded, but I'll reach out to Scott and see if he wants to. Um, if not, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll do it myself, but I'll let you guys know. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up now is I think by this Friday, meaning tomorrow, they wanted to have all speaker uh, names set in stone. So what I was going to do is send them a note to make sure they have the list we have in here in their, on their website so we don't have to change it later on. Okay. All right, so now with that behind us, unless you, oh, and can you guys think of anything else relative to the coupon EU we need to discuss? Otherwise, we'll jump into the demo. Okay, let's jump into the demo. Where is it? There it is. So I think what the, we should do now is quickly discuss some of the last minute changes that were made to the uh, Jason that's flying around just to make sure we haven't busted anything relative to Doug's um, schema. Hold on a sec while it finishes loading. This doc is getting way too big. Okay, so let's just start at the top here. Okay. So here's the very latest. Um, so I don't think last time we talked, we talked about this ping and reset. I want to talk about these and make sure you guys are okay with it because they're a little bit funky, but they're more uh, procedural or setup-ish. I'm not sure what the right word is. Um, so right now, if someone registers with the system and something happens and they end up dying, there's no way for the controller to know that they're gone. Um, and in particular, it'd be nice if he did know so that he can reassign people to different jobs. So for example, if a supplier goes away, we don't want a retailer waiting forever for him to get new cuts from that supplier. We want um, some other supplier to take up that role. And the only way for that to happen is for the controller to rebalance things out, but he can't do that if he doesn't know somebody's gone. So what I was gonna suggest was that every 60 seconds, everybody who's playing in the game send a ping. And if the controller does not get a ping from you within 90 seconds, he's going to assume you're gone and rebalance things appropriately. It, I'm not 100% sure that's eventing-ish or not, but I feel like we need something like that in order for the controller to maintain a usable demo going forward if people come and go. What do you guys think? Okay. The other concern with this is this means you can't actually write a normal serverless function to do this work. Or, or you'd have to have something else like a cron job kind of thing that wakes your thing up and says, send this ping every 60 seconds. That, that's the other part that had me a little bit worried was if someone wanted to write nothing but a pure function that scales down to zero when, it's, when he's not being asked to do anything, he can't actually do that anymore. He has to keep something up to at least send a ping every 60 seconds. Is that going to be a problem for anybody? Jude, did you want to speak? Yeah, are you guys there? <laughs> OK. 
Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you guys are like really, really quiet today. You're killing me. Okay. I mean, so does this, this sound okay? I mean, I know it's not ideal, but I don't know how else to deal with these situations. Okay, Jude, I, he's talking in Slack. So if we did turn it around though, how does the controller know that the other guy isn't there? Are you, or are you assuming it'd be a request response ping? I was wondering if the controller sent a ping out to everybody, which obviously we can make that happen. Um, the, the, are you assuming that the participant would have to send a reply back? Because a, a one, the pings are typically one way, right? Or all events are typically one way. So we'd have to turn this into a request response kind of a thing. And we'd have to use RabbitMQ for that purpose. Okay. So how, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if the, I don't know if you guys can hear that. There are children running around here. <laughs> okay, I agree with you that it allows them to scale down to zero, and then you have to come back up every minute or so whenever the guy sends a ping. Um, it, how long, because the ping goes through RabbitMQ, and it's not HTTP request response, how long do you envision the controller waiting? I mean, do you think it's fair to say he has to get a response back within five seconds? Is that sufficient? I mean, I guess we could play with the timing, but is that kind of logic sufficient for here or is that going to be problematic because things might be slow and, and I'm not sure what I'm trying to say. I'm okay with that. Okay. What do you guys think, Doug or, or, or Klaus? What do you guys think about turning the ping around and making it, in essence, a request response through, through RabbitMQ? Uh, it, in the, and this is addressing... Um, a concern that can, can you run through that scenario again where, where, where this is why this is needed right so let's say there's a supplier out there who's supplying small coffee cups to some retailer yeah. what if that supplier's system goes down okay so backing up so this supplier um, uh, generated a connection event mm -hmm. which the uh, controller um, consumed and said, okay, you're connected. So at some point that controller is distributing um, offerings based upon what it knew at a point in time where the, all the connected um, systems in their roles, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. And then, and then uh, an order is originated <clears throat> from uh, an attendee acting as a, a passenger and that then starts these orchestration of ZIF events. And, and so it'll go, you know, from a retailer to fulfill that order. And then if that retailer's out of inventory, then it's going to go to a supply, supplier and then carry gets involved. So you're saying that if that supplier, I guess, for that retailer goes offline, mm -hmm. then you have uh, those events um, that the retailer generated to replenish inventory not being acted on. Correct. Yes. Okay. And, and, and the, and so what you're saying is that if you, if the controller knew that supplier went offline, then you would create uh, send events that reflected a new event, uh, or a new offering configuration so that another supplier that was still online would be able to handle those events that were already issued. But then how does that work? Because those well, events have already been broadcast uh, from the retailer. How, how would that new supplier pick up those events? <clears throat> right. That so other I, supplier pick it up. Yeah. So actually you, you've kind of addressed two different problems and I only, and my, my solution only addresses the first half, which is, okay, somebody went away and the controller needs to rebalance who's processing what type of orders. I think 
the, the ping thing works for that scenario, right? And as, as long as there isn't sort of a offer or a, a, an order in flight, it works just fine, right? But you're right. The minute an offer is sent, if somebody doesn't receive it to process it. An order. I mean, yeah. An order is sent. An, an order is sent, yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. when, when an order is sent, if there's no one there to process it, then, you know, unless that, unless that retailer resends the order, you're right, we're screwed. Um, I haven't thought about how to address that problem yet. Do you have a recommendation? Like maybe should people be prepared to resend events if they don't get, act, or resend orders if they don't get acted upon? Or should, do you think the controller should step in here and take some action? Well, do, do you even think that's um, uh, a real concern for a five minute demo that, that, that this happening and um, or, well, or, or are you looking at it more for, <clears throat> because you know, this would certainly be an issue if this was you know, something you were gonna be putting in place in real, real world, but for, for a five minute demo, it, <laughs> so, okay, so I, I'm basing this upon previous experience with our other demos, which is, you're right, technically it's a five minute demo, we can just make sure everybody's up and running and, and everything's fine. People have used these demos for meetups or other types of events outside of the initial KubeCon type of environment. And, I, and I'm hoping people keep up their endpoints after the KubeCon so that they can choose to show this in a meetup, for example, if they wanted to, because we have people, have people do that. And that's why, for example, the Mad Libs demo is still up there because people do occasionally use these things. Got it. And so as these things come and go, I want people to have basically a running, a, a working demo that they can use at any point in time. So Jude, you're talking about a timeout. Um, that definitely is possible, um, but um, when the timeout happens, do you think the controller would resend the offer or do you think it would um, somehow tell the retailer to, 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 to resend it himself? How do you see the timeout playing out? Because what I'm actually also wondering about is whether if, if the controller had a timeout, then we probably don't need the ping because they kind of serve the same purpose in a way. Right? So if the controller noticed that an, an order was sent, but a corresponding action wasn't taken as a result of that, he could assume that guy is, who was supposed to be processing is now dead and rebalance everything. And then he could technically resend. Um, yeah, so yeah, he could make the controller resend. He could send out the, the thing again, again after he does the rebalancing. I, I all. like that because that, that you're, you're, you have your inherent... Uh, um, ping or non-ping from the the timeout. Yeah, I definitely like that solution better as well because it, it allows everybody to also be completely uh, serverless as well. Um, let me think about that because that's a lot of work in the controller. Um, but I guess he has all the information to know, right? I mean, he knows what supplier is supposed to pick it up. He knows what carrier is supposed to react to the supplier. Okay, let me, let me think about that. My poor intern, okay. <laughs> um, okay, let me, let me think about that and see if it's possible. I think it's, I, I know technically it's possible, it's just a fair amount of work. I need to figure out scheduling wise so that we can get that in there. Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me think about that one. Uh, let me make a comment here. Um, I mean, I think it would be easy for him to, because he's putting the graphics on, right? So he's showing, uh, all he has to do is look at his graphics. And when an icon has been sitting, you know, if he's, if he's tracking the time that, uh, you know, a graphical element is sitting idle, sitting <clears throat> in one place, right, for too long, then he's, he's rerouting. Mm, I, don't, no. I don't get to it. But. No, it, well, not, not quite, right? So, for example, well, okay, so let's, let's walk through the scenario. A retailer gets an order from a customer for small, or something happens and the retailer says, I need to order more cups, and it has to be small. 
um, he will, he knows enough to put an icon on the screen that says, this guy's ordered small, it's a little bubble. Actually, have you guys seen the latest? I guess I could show you that. Uh, source. I, I went to the, did you, he moved it again, it looks like. Maybe, well, the source dog and source dog and soap are the same thing, so don't worry too much about that. Um, but oops, hold on a minute, let me, uh, I need to bring in some controllers or some participants, hold on. Gosh, my machine is like dying today, it's so slow. Um, get on. Oh, wait, sorry. There we go. Okay. I love the dynamic nature of this thing. Okay. So, um, you guys can see that, right? Okay, cool. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so, I'm going to place an order at one. Small. So yes, he knows enough to put up that little bubble um, when he orders something small, but he doesn't necessarily know that there's anything like not moving per se. Um, and because in order for him to know that, for example, that a truck did not leave the warehouse, he first has to know that the supplier got the request and there's no graphical aspect to that. So that's why I'm not quite sure, Doug, your, your comment well, about... Well, the, the, if if in the in this um, one that you went through in this flow, mm -hmm. if the if the re, if the supplier had disconnected, okay, mm -hmm. wh where would this thing have stopped visually on the screen? It would have been here. Actually, I think I can actually force this. Oh well, yeah, it would have been um, the bubble that appeared here to the left with the small coffee cup would would be sitting there, and that would be it nothing else would happen on the screen okay well that he must have in his his program uh identified that bubble as an object right where he knows where its position is i would think and then if that had a timer associated with it then yeah he could I, I kind know. of yeah. yeah well no I, I, like I said, i'm sure i can make him figure it out it's just i just need to work through it but just let let you guys know the way this happens is everything on here we tried our best to make it completely event driven so that the controller was not was as, was as dumb as possible which is i can't think the kind of way it should be so the reason the bubble appeared is because the retailer sent an event out saying he needs more cups that's why he did it it's not because of any other reason like he didn't keep track of the number of cups with the retailer okay so he he tracked the event that went through route at mq and that's why the event went up there um so he doesn't have any smarts about really anything else. Um, so in order to make this happen, he now has to not only detect that event, but now, as you said, start a timer that says, okay, if I don't see an event coming from this supplier um, asking for that size coffee cup for this retailer, after a certain amount of time, I need to take this supplier offline and resend that event. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it in real life, if if all of these events were flowing through the through each system, is fine, right? Everything was connecting, but but that supplier did not act on it. His system got got the event, but he didn't take action. You mm -hmm. know, you're not going to shut down your entire supply chain because he didn't take action. So you you would need a mechanism that that at some point allowed for rerouting an order. Like if a retailer ordered something from a supplier and he didn't deliver it in time, he, he would need to reroute that order to another supplier. Totally agree in a real world scenario. I totally agree. Um, just didn't have the real world scenario in there yet, but yeah. <laughs> but maybe we need to make it out and that's fine. This kind of sounds like what you're doing is just reflecting what could, you know, an ex a real world exception, you know, where yeah, you know, it's exception handling. So yeah, and that's fine. Okay. Um, I can definitely do that or ask him to do that. Um, I'm not sure when it's going to get in there, but hopefully before Monday. Um, but okay, we can definitely do that. And that, that addresses the problem. So we can probably look at killing this, which is fine. Um, <clears throat> now this, this next event here, I don't know whether we need this or not. Um, 
but the reason I added this was because I, there were times when I wanted participants to reset their environments. Um, and maybe this isn't necessary, but um, in my setup, I have it so that I can actually add new retailers, new suppliers at will. And granted, I did this so I could test the system out, you know, to, for example, to make sure everything's dynamic. So as new retailers came on board, this thing will grow. Um, in, our, in our scenarios, maybe that's not an issue, right? Maybe everything's more static, but I needed a reset in order to have the system tell everybody to re-register themselves with the system. Okay, bye Klaus. Um, because one of the things that I noticed is if the controller recycles, he doesn't necessarily keep track of who's involved and maybe that's the problem, maybe he needs to. But right now he doesn't keep track of anything about who's playing and this, when he comes up, he sends out a reset and has everybody re-register. And that tells also anybody who was dynamically adding warehouses, suppliers or controllers, just to make the environment more interesting to also reset those back down to their default value or their initial value. And, and, and what would trigger this? This is, this, is, this is just the controller deciding to reset the environment for whatever reason, whether it's because he restarted or because someone wants to rerun the demo from the very beginning and they want a, and they, they wanted a fresh environment. So technically anybody could send the reset event, not just the controller. So if, if you had, like you said, out, outside the KubeCon demo, you had others that just at any point in time wanted to go up and, and run through this demo. If you had two separate groups running the demo at the same time, <laughs> then what happens? Then yes, they may, they, stop, they may stop on each other. And luckily we never had that problem. But, but, but see, what's interesting is <clears throat> depending on how you want to show the scenario, right? If you want to, as you walk through it, you want to be able to show the connection message. Well, if there's a connection message only happens once and it was a month ago, you're never going to see it again without a reset. Assuming everybody stayed connected the whole time, right? So that's the other thing is if you want to be able to reset the entire environment and be able to show the connections, flows and stuff like that, then that, that, that works. So let me, let, me, let me just show you what that looks like. Hold on a minute. Let me show you an example. Uh, okay, so for example, watch this. If I want to add another retailer, let's call it R1. Okay, so now another retailer got added, and it's this guy right here on the right, and you can see the connection, right? And that's all wonderful and good. So if someone wants to, you know, really screw with the system, or not screw with the system, but really show things being dynamic, and they want to be able to show, you know, a whole bunch of things coming and going. They want to show the system rebalancing or whatever like that. They could do some funky stuff like, you know, start deleting retailers, right? And that's all well and good. But at some point, they may want to say, okay, I'm done screwing around and I want everybody to go back to their original state. They can do a reset and everything goes back. And that's what the reset message is you see right here. It got sent. I received it. And therefore I reconnected everybody up. I disconnected everybody who wasn't there and I had my five or five different connections, two retailers, two suppliers, and one carrier. And that makes sense to me, but who has control over that reset I think is important because you could have some somebody up there clicking reset all the time and blowing out the game for anybody that was trying to participate. That is true. So so at a minimum, <clears throat> the only people that would ever know about the reset are the same people who have access to the queue, which are the people who have the user ID and password to the queue, which are only us, right? So it's not like any random person can do a reset or actually do anything with this. So that, that part's a little bit secure. The, the only concern we have is what you were talking about, which is what if two people are running the demo at the same time? Whoa. Why, why things disappear? That's kind of funky. Well, I just think you send uh, that the that that you would put on the UI that the game is being reset. And, yeah, I mean, we we could do something like that. Or what we've done in the past is also people have told the group when they were using it, and just to make sure no one was screwing with it at the time. That's another thing. I'm less worried about that, to be honest. No, but I think um, I think the reset's important. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
I, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll keep that in there. Why did everything get pulled away? Weird. Okay, I'll have to look into that. Okay, so I'll keep this for right now. Um, so Jude, I'm not sure I understand your question. 100% reset doesn't involve the controller as well. It does involve the controller. The controller forgets everything and forces every, and requires everybody to re-register, if that's what you mean. Which is why, in my case, I had to resend the connection messages. Yes, I agree. After a reset, everybody needs to reset their connection, otherwise the controller will assume they're not there. Okay, good, yes. Okay, um, in that case, let's scroll down and see where anything's changed. I think I made one change, and unfortunately I don't think I had change control on, so let me see if I can find it. And then, okay, it may have been here. We may, I may have, this may have been it. I think originally we had here, we had order in both places, meaning when the customer placed an order and when the retailer placed an order, I couldn't tell the difference between the two. Um, they were, I'm not quite sure why I couldn't tell the difference, actually, now that I think about it, because this one has provider, but there was some reason I couldn't tell the difference between them, or maybe it was when well, the retailer. I, th I, think, I think what had happened is in our last call, we talked about changing source for the passenger order from being uh, saying passenger to saying retailer. So that yeah. it was, re you know, and, you know, I said I didn't, didn't bother me, but then when you went to, to implement that and then you found the uh, problem, so you, to, to distinguish between the two, it, Yes, here. I, yeah. I, right. I, I would much prefer it to be the type to just remain order on both cases and then use source to um, differentiate. Yeah, um, you get. Be because that way you're keeping in line with the, the, the class structure of you know, schema.org and with the airport semantic model. Right. Because, okay. because there's no difference in that. There's one concept called order with one set of attributes and yeah. and so anyway, if you, if you could do that, that, just put it back the way it was, I think. So change this back to, change this back passenger. to passenger, basically. passenger, yeah. Right. So Jude, would, would you be okay with that? Okay. So I'll make a note of that. Okay. And then order, uh, you know, the dot customer and dot oh, retailer yeah. go away. Pow. Whoops. Okay. Um, now, Jude, you or you put this here. Did you need that for some sort of disambiguation, or was there another reason you needed that? Okay. But it sounds like Doug, you're saying that it breaks the model. It breaks the model. Are you okay with removing that, Jude? Okay. So well, I can't do that. Okay. So we'll, okay. Good. Okay. So we'll kill that one. So order. Okay. And this one down here, um, I think that makes sense. Just trying to think. I want to make sure we exit that up above. So we should probably add it here as well, shouldn't we, Jude? But you had you had small in the subject. Oh, you're so right. That's where you didn't need it again. Oh, okay. So so in the subject. That's a good point. So Jude, why do you think we need this here? Oh, wait, what did, what did you see over here? Hold on a minute. Gosh, I wish this thing would scroll. Interesting. So, Doug, you have any reaction to that? Um, you know, uh, go, go back to where you're defining the original offer. Do you mean when the controller sends it out? Right. So that, mm -hmm. Okay. 
do, 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 offer controller to, okay, so here's one going to a retailer, yeah. Okay, so you had sort, you had uh, type as an offer product, and then you had, in the data, you had offer small, medium, large. So I guess to be consistent with this, um, it, down below your source would be, your, your type would be offer dot product, right? And and yeah. then you would put in. Well, hold on. Let me just, let me just paste them side by side so we can see them. Right. Because okay. these should be the same. Uh, well, you have subject supplier there, so we didn't really pick the one from the retailer, but the retailer has a similar one. True. Uh, well, right. I'll, I'll, let me just double check. We'll make, save it. Just so we're consistent. Do, 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 do. Right there, I think. No, uh, no, sorry. Go up more. No. <laughs> Subject. That's supplier. Carrier. Here is it. That's a connection. Darn it. Where is it? No, we don't have one for the retailer. We don't because we don't tell the retailer what he orders or what he offers. He offer everybody offers small, medium, large. That's why. Okay, so it's a new. Um... Okay, so go, go, go back to what. Um what you'd want it to do? Because I don't think it matters. I mean, I, th I think if you put, if it's just putting offer or uh, yeah, he small, it, uh, the subject in that case, okay. I, again, we're, we're kind of, creating a hybrid here anyway. So it, it, as long as the type is offer, um, it, uh, in it, you could put size in, you know, in, in the data, if that helps. And then, so, and then just remove in subject becomes, I guess, irrelevant at that point. Yeah, that, that was going to be my question. So Jude, if we did that, what would subject be in this case? Oh, okay. We can remove it. I, but from a um, uh, from a pub sub perspective, isn't it easier to react to type source and subject where that's matching for a retailer, and not have to get into the the data to find that? I don't know. It, it, no, you, you have to anyways because you got to get inventory level. Well, it, you are well. Well, wait, well, it's a couple of things there. One, I think you are correct. However. Um, there's nothing that says a cloud event can't have data in the data in the data section as well as in the headers. And that's perfectly allowable. In fact, we actually recommend it because cloud well, events should not well, be why interesting. Not, why don't you just leave it in both places? That way okay. you're showing there's flexibility there to. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. However, does this mean that, hold on. Inventory level. Let's search back up. That means we should probably include it here as well for consistency, right? Right. Oops. Uh, size. It was size colon small, right? Right. Yep. Small s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me just make sure. <clears throat> okay. So then we do that, and that's the previous flow. So okay. I think I don't think that's an issue. Okay, I think that's it then. Okay, um, does everything still seem okay to you guys, real flow-wise? I think it's amazing that it all came together like this. So. <laughs> well, we're not done yet. Wait, wait till other people get involved. I'm sure they'll find yeah. issues. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, but I, I think, I think as of right now, as long as we have. Uh, the ability to uniquely identify each event and know it's specifically who it's for and what its purpose in life is, and we don't get ambiguity like we had for a minute there, I think we're good. That that's my biggest concern. So, okay. Um, in that case, uh, I'll take the action to try to get the intern to make the controller smarter relative to people coming and going. Um, and I think that's it then. Other than maybe next Monday, formally telling everybody to start coding. Okay, so um, if I was to share this work to the, at this point, I, th those uh, the um, 
URLs to the the two parts of the of the of the UI are are um, th they're right there, right? That's not moving, and the, those are always up at this point. Um, or do they get shut down? So okay, so they are not moving. Um, uh, stability of them is a little questionable. It depends on how I leave things. I, I'm trying okay. my best to keep it up. Um, the, I, I can't guarantee they're up 24 seven yet, but I'm trying my best to keep them up as, as much as I can. So yes, I just can't guarantee it. Okay. And then, and then the, the, all this you did in go, right. With all the microservices and did, where is it, is that available? So point? yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll double check with the intern to make sure he's comfortable with exposing the controller logic. Um, I don't the controller doesn't even, it's more about what would be implemented by the, <laughs> I, was afraid you're, I was afraid you're going to say that. Okay. Um, give me a, give me a couple more days to fix sure. that. Okay. I, I, I did something kind of hacky because everything's in one gigantic executable right now. I didn't have separate microservices for things. It was just easier for me to manage it that way. I do want to break it up. Um, so give me, give me a little bit of time to, to split it up. So it actually looks a little prettier. Okay. So the URLs is this one here. And what, what's the other one? The other one is just uh, airport without the airport slash view. Without the view. Yeah, the airport without the view should take you to uh, what people do on their phone. Okay. And just so you know, I'm not telling anybody outside of our little group, in order to get this little pop-up down here so you can actually simulate a phone on the screen without actually pulling out your phone, just hit control P. It shows it and hides it. That way you can run the demo without having to get it out your phone. Make sense? Oh, okay. So just do a control P on this screen. Yes. And it, yep. it'll bring that up. Yep. Got it. Okay. Okay. It's really freaky that things start disappearing. Okay. I'll work on that. Must be some, some, there must be some, game, some messages getting lost in translation. Okay. Oh, cool, Jude. I'm glad you can get it up and running. Um, let me ask you a question. Do you guys have any experience with RabbitMQ? The, uh, reason I'm ask okay, the reason I'm asking is because um, I'm actually running RabbitMQ inside of a Docker container, <clears throat> and it was up for oh, the passing. Okay, um, it, I have it in a Docker container, and, it's, and it was running for days, and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden, it crashed, and it gave me an error that indicated to me it ran out of memory, which to me says it's keeping these events in memory someplace, and it's not draw, it's not deleting them as people pull them off the queues. So. It's you know? interesting that uh, Ju just mentioned Redis because that um, there's another implementation very similar to this that used um, Redis. Um, uh, but it, RabbitMQ was chosen because somebody had suggested it, right? Yeah, there's no hard requirement. I mean, if, if, yeah. if there's a better choice, I think we could switch. Well, oh, I, we could I was going to contact Redis <laughs> if they wanted to participate in this. Um, so. Is Redis so, just a pub subsystem? I've, I've never actually used it. No, it's a, 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 a events. Um, um, it's for used, can be used for event sourcing um, and in memory, uh, persi you know, persistence of um, these events. And so how, how so it has it? its own, it has a way to, uh, they have a new streaming uh, uh, component, I guess, that was released just this year that is probably pretty relevant to this. But uh, again, I was just going to go contact them. Uh, uh, the LF Edge um, uh, projects like Edge X is including Redis and in what they're doing. Um, so anyway, I was just going to see if, if that if, what they what they thought about this. So the events won't, be, won't persist once consumed, which actually I like. However, can you have multiple subscribers receiving the same event? Okay, if the answer is no, then that's a problem, right? Because we want multiple people to receive the events. So I think that's a problem. With Redis you're talking about? Yeah, according okay. to what Jude is saying, yeah. Okay. So we need something that allows one event to get fanned out to multiple people. I just need to figure out how to make Redis, not Redis, uh, RabbitMQ, delete them after everybody's received it. 
because otherwise I need to recycle RabbitFQ every now and then because it runs out of memory. So, but anyway, that's my problem. As a timeout, you mean for how long it sits in, in memory? Ooh, if you can give me that timeout, I'll do that. Because if I set the timeout to be like a minute, that should be more than enough time. So if you can point me to some documentation for that. I'll, all right, I'll look as well. So that'd be cool. Thank you. Yeah, give me a sec. But in the meantime, uh, did it, there you go. Hold on a second. Do, 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 do. Ooh, I like that. Interesting. Um, so, okay, that's one thing I don't actually do is I don't have a config file. Maybe I should start looking into that. <laughs> um, I just basically bring up a uh, RabbitMQ Docker image and use the RabbitMQ CLI just to add a user. Um, but maybe I need to look at config files. Uh, hold on a minute. Oh, okay. Well, I don't, we don't need to take up your time. I can, I can investigate this offline, but this at least gives me something to look at. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, anything else you guys want to talk about? Oh, that's good, Doug. Yep. Yeah, it look, it's looking more and more like an airport. I think there are a couple little minor tweaks, but it's, it's, it's getting closer to look like an airport. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of funny. Um, Redis does pub sub, but what does that mean? It does, does it do fan out is the question. Hold on. Oh, fan out. So what would be the advantage to using Redis over RabbitMQ? I I would say I'd rather get a Redis representative involved and let them see how they would handle this, you know? Interesting. So how, hmm. I'm assuming it's, it's, it's still a pull model, just like RabbitMQ, right? Redis is all about in memory. No, what I meant is how do people get the events? I'm assuming they have to sort of initiate a connection to Redis and then events start flowing. It's not like Redis opens a connection to the client or to, yeah. to the receiver, right? We push by Redis to all the subscribed clients. And I'm assuming, I'm assuming it's similar to RabbitMQ though, right? It's a persistent connection. And if the connection gets dropped and you reconnect, you won't lose events during that downtime, right? They'll just sit there in the queue. Is that right, Jude? They'll just sit in the queue until the person reconnects? Okay, see that? Mm. Actually, that might be okay, actually. Because I don't even think in RabbitMQ it does that. At least not. I haven't noticed that. Yeah, there you go. So I'm no, we're no worse off. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'll take a look at this. Um, Cause I'm assuming switching between RabbitMQ and, and Redis from an implementation perspective is not a huge change. Just switching out which library you call and stuff like that. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll post what I, the, the implement, there's, there's learning.com that implemented uh, uh, very similar um, use of eventing um, that, that's showing, uh, you know, commerce um, and they used Redis. And so I'll just send you that link because it, it you know, and this kind of mentioned, I, I almost want them to participate in this. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, if we can get, if we get, you know, toss Redis's name in there as a participant, that. That's well, cool. and, and that uh, the end user learning.com. But yeah, um, the, um, you should be able to kind of, I, I hope RabbitMQ will work and then you don't have to worry about switching things out last minute. 
Well, we, we, we kind of need to decide, right? Uh, it, and it's up to you guys because I have no opinion on this whatsoever. I'm, I'm not. What, I'm, what does Jude prefer? Yeah, Jude, which would you would like? Redis. <laughs> okay. Is that okay with you, Doug? I, I don't. Yeah, I don't no, care. Um, as long as it works, I don't give a crap. Well, we but, but if you give all this to Jude, what you've got, and since he knows it, right? I mean, you could That's true. do a, a Redis implementation of what you got. Yeah. And that is true. And if it doesn't work and Redis doesn't work for us, we get to blame Jude. So as long as we have someone <laughs> to put the finger at, I'm, I'm happy. Because so. <laughs> that's what life is all about, having someone to blame. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll take a look at that and see what it would take um, from the controller side to, to switch things out. I, as I said, I, I can't imagine it's a big deal because the transport mechanism getting these things back and forth should be fairly lightweight. Okay. So I'll, I'll start playing with that. Code is easier, by the way. Yeah, that's what you say. Okay. <laughs> we'll play with it. Actually, to be honest, I didn't use the S. Actually, uh, I didn't use S. Well, I did use a Golang SDK, I guess, but I don't, it didn't seem that painful to me, but I just followed blindly some instructions. So, anyway, I think we're wrapping up here. Besides that, I'm getting really hungry for lunch. <laughs> All right. So, uh, it, there's a, a Monday call then on this? Is that yeah. Still planned? Hope, okay. So hopefully, hopefully, on Monday, we'll be able to say uh, start coding and we'll be good to go. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. Good good All right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.